Good. Okay. Welcome everyone to the Cotswold Fair Food Waste webinar. This is the third, I think, of these series. The first one we did in was on uh, carbon, second one on plastic, and today we're talking about food waste. And obviously all three are vital parts of being sustainable um, in the in the world of food and drink, which we, we all are. And of course, they're all in, interconnected as well. So obviously carbon is involved in, in making plastic and it's a product of fossil fuel. Uh, plastic's a product of fossil fuel industry. Food waste, some of you may not know, generates potentially up to 28 times more carbon if it goes to landfill. Um, and obviously one way of reducing food waste is putting things in plastic. So all these things are highly interconnected and nothing is straightforward. So hopefully by the end of today, you'll have a, a, a few more ideas and hopefully you're also inspired to do more about this issue, which is horrendous if you look at how much food is wasted join the world in a single day. So I'm Paul Hargreaves, CEO of Cotswold Fair. Um, at Cotswold Fair, our purpose is to inspire, delight, and make a difference to people's lives and to the planet through our shared passion for food. And hopefully we'll be doing that today. I think I'll introduce the speakers as, as we go through and we need to to crack on. We have five speakers. We have Dan from City Harvest, first of all, Patrick from Winnow, Caroline from Too Good To Go, Jenny from Rubies in the Rubble, and finally Alex from Dash Water. And hopefully, if they all keep to time, we will have some time for questions at the end. So first up, let's introduce Dan, Dan McAlpine. He's the Senior Food Sourcing Manager at City Harvest, which is one of our main charity partners, all, um, all Cotswold Fair's potential food waste isn't wasted, it goes to City Harvest. Dan joined City Harvest as the Senior Food Sourcing Manager in July 2020, and he comes with a background in food manufacturing, working for Bacavore and Adderley Foods. But now he's turning his attention to saving and repurposing surplus food from all parts of the supply chain, ensuring that wherever possible, edible food finds its way onto a human plate. So Dan, over to you and thanks very much for joining us today. No problem, thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me just, first of all, share my screen. Let me know when you can see that. Can you see that? Some nods will be great. That's all good, yes. All good. Lovely, thank you. So as Paul said, my name is Dan. I'm the uh, Senior Food Sourcing Manager here at City Harvest. So my role is to source food um, from all different parts of the supply chain. So from farms all the way through to retailers and, and end users. And today I'm gonna to be telling you about what we do, City Harvest, why we're needed, who we support and who supports us in 10 minutes. So let's crack on. So. First of all, the need. Why is City Harvest needed? So a few stats for you here um, in terms of London. So we're a London-based charity, 9.2 million meals are missed every single month within London. So that could be families or individuals not eating. 13.3 million meals are wasted or a surplus within the food industry. So as City Harvest, we aim to bridge the gap between the meals needed and the meals that are surplus and are wasted. And we are a, a logistics charity, let's say. We've got a fleet of 16 vans, a large warehouse in Acton, a smaller one in New Spitalfields Market. We get the food from anywhere in the food industry and make sure it's found its way to a, a human plate where possible. So what we do in terms of our operation, every single day we redistribute about 10 to 12 tonnes of food projects around London and to kind of picture that it's about 20 to 25 pallets of food and we take that to about 350 charities every single week and the way we support our charities is that we give them the food for free we don't buy food we don't sell food 
we ask for donations of surplus or, or extra food from our food partners and we give them out for free so our charity partners then can save on average forty thousand pounds per year depending on the size of the charity and then they can spend that on other parts of their services so things like counseling and skills training and play equipment for, for youth centers and things like that each of our charities get an annualized budget we just support them with the the food costs in that respect so of the kind of 10 to 12 tons a day that we redistribute we only cover about nine percent of the need in london alone so there's massive room to grow um, and our services is growing kind of week by week post pandemic so our beneficiaries so we kind of nice infographic here shows who we support so quite a large proportion of our food goes to homeless shelters lots to children families youth centers domestic violence shelters and hostels and because we support a wide range of charities we then can take a wide range of food from our food donors so we take everything from catering size packs that might be better suited for a homeless shelter that are doing mass catering everything down to pre-prepared meals that might be better at a hostel where the, the kitchens are smaller the kitchens have less equipment skill level of the people using the kitchens might be slightly less therefore they pre-prepared meals and meals that can be easily eaten on the go or you know, within a smaller kitchen environment. So we have around 150 live donors at the moment, food donors, um, and we take the food from them in all different shapes and sizes and packaging formats and quantities. And there's a, an interesting stat at the top here from RAP, Four million tons of food a year is wasted in the UK from the manufacturing, retail, and wholesale sectors alone. And that doesn't include farms. So when you add farms to that, you're talking six to seven million tons of food. So a city harvest, we work with our donors to make sure we're helping them achieving net zero in food waste, but finding innovative ways that we can unlock surplus within their operations. So we work with people on this call. So Cotswold Fair, Rubes in the Rubble, we've worked with lots of uh, food donors within their new development, new product development. So that's my background, new product development, where you know you make a couple of thousand of a product, you use half for your testing, and the other half either go to staff, go to food waste, or be diverted to charities like ourselves we'll find a home for it in the local area around london and you know lots of people on this call from lots of different areas of the food industry i'm sure a few of these ring true for you order cancellations so if you ever work with the big retailers you might be making your volume on a forecast we all know at 12 o'clock cut off on a forecast when you dip in below that or you you've made too much you're left then to, to hold on to those pallets and if you have the luxury to roll them over to the next day brilliant but if you don't have that if you're working on tight shelf life and you're left with stock that still has six days life seven days life but it doesn't meet the needs of the the retailer of, of your customer so that's where city harvest can come in and take them off your hands for free we can collect we get delivered food and uh, we'll and find a home for that and make sure it doesn't go to landfill so other forms of food waste so seasonal stock your christmas lines your summer lines everything that might have branded packaging that is not needed anymore again we can take that um, and plenty of other on there sell by dates use by dates we can add use by date extensions so here is an interesting hierarchy prioritization so some agree with this some don't this is what we base our kind of food waste strategy on so lots of food businesses claim to be net zero so that's the kind of phrase that's going around at the moment net zero so as long as it doesn't go to the red one at the bottom you're net zero however there should be a hierarchy for prioritization of food surplus first of all within the food industry is prevention no food company wants to be creating waste however if you worked in the food industry 
you understand that waste is is a part of production you need to make to forecast you need to make extra your, your worst case is you, you short a customer so you need to make more and then what do you do with that extra city harvest then reuse that for human consumption so we'll find a home for it on a plate rather than it go to animal fuel feed or biofuel where the food all the energy that's gone into making that food and just gets used up um, in animal feed or, or biofuel so you can run down their prevention reuse human consumption animal feed all the way down to the disposal at the bottom the disposal at the bottom is bad for two different reasons and paul touched upon it as well so if you you send your stock to landfill not only are you wasting the energy that's gone into that food produce it you're also then exposing that food then to more greenhouse gases so as it sits in landfill you are producing the greenhouse gases on that food and city harvest can save that food give it to human consumption but also prevent the greenhouse gas emissions that come from, from a landfill disposal of that so like i said we've got about 150 different donors live at the moment we've got about 2000 on our books have donated to us in the last 7 years um, but 150 live at the moment, of which Cotswold Fair are a kind of a big player in that. So Cotswold Fair and City Harvest have had a great relationship since about 2018. I think we met them at Speciality Fine Food Fair, got to talk to them, understand what they were about, understand what we were about. We've worked with them since to unlock food up to the tune of 48 and a half tonnes in their supply chain in the last three years. And that equates about 115,000 meals in total to feed people that need it in and around London. And in doing so, I've diverted 184 tonnes of greenhouse gases from saving the product from landfill. So thank you, Cotswold Fair. Thank you to all our donors that make our work possible now and in the future. So take home message really for me today is, is your business following the food surplus hierarchy where possible? Claiming to be net zero is one thing. However, claiming to net zero and then feeding the people in the local areas around you is the next step. And if you have food to donate, please do get in touch with any of the food redistribution charities in London or around the UK. There's plenty. We've got full UK coverage in the UK. So I'd ask you to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. I know you were nervous about that. It's the first webinar. I think you did a brilliant job. So thanks very much. If you just uh, unshare your screen now, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, so obviously City Harvest are a charity. All the other um, presenters we're having are all actually from companies and they're all from B Corp companies. So more on that in a minute. Our next guest is Patrick. Um, Patrick Renard, who's the UK Head of Strategic Partnerships at Winnow. Now, he will explain this far better than me, but Winnow is a, a great bit of tech that helps reduce waste in commercial kitchens. And we're just installing it at our food hall and kitchen at, at Flourish in between Bristol and Bath. I found that inverted triangle, Dan, really helpful. And we will be sharing the, the slides afterwards. So, most of the speakers today are on in the reuse part of the triangle, but this next talk is going to be in the prevention of food waste, right at the top of that inverted triangle. Uh, and that's what Winnow does. So Patrick has extensive international sales and business development experience across Europe and the Middle East, and he holds specialist knowledge in corporate environmental sustainability and in managing complex strategic project. So Patrick, tell us more about Winnow. Patrick, are you there? I think you may have frozen. I think we may have lost Patrick. Um... Yeah. Let's jump to Caroline then, shall we? <laughs> Is that Patrick sharing his screen? Uh, yeah, okay, we've unshared that. Fantastic. So we'll come back to Patrick. Unless he's suddenly appeared. No. So Caroline, over to you. Um, too good to go. 
is a way of uh, reusing food that would have otherwise gone to waste. Uh, we know Caroline, who worked for one of our suppliers in the past, and Too Good To Go has also been used at Flourish, and so far we've get, we've um, sold 100 magic bags, which probably means we need to get the ordering slightly better. We hope that that <laughs> down over time, but um, Too Good To Go is another B Corp, and starting to be very well known in the food industry uh, and it's an app by which you can order at reduced prices food that would have other been waste otherwise been wasted in retail or catering environments so caroline over to you sorry uh you, we've jumped you at the queue have you ready to go uh, yeah absolutely more about too good to go Braille, thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. So Too Good To Go, we are an app, um, but we are more than that, um, which I'll go through uh, with you in, in a minute. Um, but this is basically why, we're he why we are here. And um, to echo what Dan said, um, food waste is a, a huge um, problem. It's an environmental problem and social and economic problem as well. Um, it's actually directly responsible for 10% of all greenhouse gas emissions, um, which if you think about it, is um, more than the whole of the aviation industry, which actually accounts for 1%. Um, so this is just food waste. So not food production, only food waste. So if we can reduce food waste, it's actually the, the number one solution to combat climate change as well. Um, obviously, there's the social and economic impacts as well. And um, as Dan said, we want to try and get this food to people um, over anything else. Um, and at the moment, unfortunately, 40% of all food is ending up um, in, in waste landfill or AD, um, you know, otherwise basically then going to people. So um, if you can see that, is it loading properly? Yes, OK. Uh, so basically, these are the five pillars in which Too Good To Go works across. Um, if you know us, you will know us primarily for our marketplace which is our app, um, and that is how we directly work with businesses, and that can be any business with food or drinks. So we work all along the supply chain from farmers, producers, wholesalers, manufacturers, through to retailers, uh, pubs, restaurants, bars, anybody that might have food and drink. We do, however, do a lot of work across our other pillars, which people may be less aware of. Um, so for the likes of households and businesses, uh, we try to affect change um, and kind of behave behaviors at home. Uh, we do a lot of work on social media to get into households to um, think about how they are using food uh, to try and educate the general public on the difference between um, date labeling for example so the differences between use by best before sell by display until all of those labels um, we work across schools and universities so on our website there's a knowledge hub um, with a lot of information and educational material broken down into age group which schools and universities can access. Uh, we provide uh, materials for seminars and lectures as well. Um, and we also work with public affairs. So we work a lot with RAP and DEFRA in this country, um, but we are also a global business. Um, we're in 17 countries. Uh, so we work a lot with the EU, 14 of our countries are in Europe. Um, and we basically are trying to I hate the word lobby, but lobby a government to spark policy change, to um, make food waste kind of a bigger priority. Uh, so we're trying to get it on curriculum, for example, in schools. Um, we're working at the moment with RAP and DEFRA on a our date labeling campaign, which is called Look, Smell, Taste, Don't Waste. So again, back to um, households and affecting change in households, trying to make the general public um, more aware and working with businesses to really kind of amplify the message of the differences between best before and used by labels as well. So that's a very quick whistle stop tour of, of Too Good To Go. There's a lot of detail in each of those pillars, but I've got 10 minutes, so I'm not going to go into much of it. Um, just to give you an idea of our reach, uh, we, this needs updating, that's 15 countries. We've launched two countries this year. Uh, so in the UK alone, we have six and a half million users of our app, um, and we've got over 14,000 businesses on on the app as well, so different stores. Um, that everything on Too Good To Go is called a store, whether it's a farmer or an actual store. Um, and we've saved over six and a half million meals from going to waste as well. Uh, so just to give you an idea of some of the businesses that work with us, uh, obviously there's 14,000 in this country, so it just gives you a little sample taste um, of some of the producers 
um, and also some wholesalers that, that work with us currently as well. I'm going to attempt to play this video, so hopefully you should hear it. I did check and it did work before, so fingers crossed it works this time, just to give you uh, a flavour from, from our partners actually using the app rather than me telling you how good it is, uh, these guys can do it for us. Too Good To Go is a completely different concept to anything we've seen before. It has significantly reduced our food waste and allowed us to get our food in front of an audience that was previously inaccessible. We wanted to make sure we were playing our part in protecting the environment and Too Good To Go felt like the perfect option. Too Good To Go has given us the opportunity to reduce our own waste as well as supporting the local community. The app was really easy to implement and we're now fully in the swing of things. We definitely recommend Too Good To Go to any wholesalers or businesses looking to reduce their food waste. I've already recommended Too Good To Go to several companies and I'll continue to do so. When it's between throwing food in the bin and using Too Good To Go, the decision's a no-brainer. It's been perfect and so easy to use. Now it's one of our first sort of avenues to explore every time we have um, an issue with stock. And so it was quick, easy access to the market and we've got access to hundreds of customers all in one, one go. Great to see these high quality products still being appreciated. We're playing our small part in preventing global warming as well, so. In one word, too good to go is unique. Rewarding. Innovative. Purely incredible. Great, so that was just some of our partners. Um, we'll forgive the last guy because purely incredible is two words, we said one, um, but at least it was, uh, oh, no, I don't want to play again. Right, so a bit more on um, how it works then. So as an app, we are, and as a business, we are purely uh, charity first. So if food can get to charities and it can get redistributed to people who need it, then it absolutely should. Um, we are there for any bits and pieces that are left at the end. Um, and businesses can sell it through our app to recover some costs. So how that works from a customer side of things, um, they would scroll down through the stores available in their area pick on one that they like the look of, um, have a look at what they could get inside the, what we call magic bag. Uh, then they would simply reserve that bag and get a receipt for that and wait to go and collect it at the um, collection time window, which is shown at the top there between nine and 12, 12 p.m. So customers can't turn up whenever they like, they do have a set time window, which the business set themselves. Uh, from a store perspective, then every user um, who wants access to the store um, from that business would have uh, their own login details. We would set um, a supply level and then actually on site, uh, there's very little to do for the stores. So they would just um, basically have to check a receipt. Everything else is done through the app. All the payment is taken through the app. Uh, we deal with all of the uh, receipt and invoicing as well. Um, and we deal with all the customer care. So actually on site transactionally, it's very, very simple, very straightforward. We've tried to make it as easy as possible for businesses to use us because we know you guys are busy and don't have much time. And we are competing at the moment with um, throwing things in the bin, which ultimately is the easiest solution. So we need to be quick, simple and um, easy to use. And then just to run through some actual benefits for brands using us, obviously the main reason is to fight food waste. Um, we say many small things make a big impact. Just to give you an idea on that, if you save one magic bag, so if you list one bag on the app um, and that sells every day for a year, that would save the same amount of CO2 as driving from Land's End to John O'Groats and then back again. So making small, um, uh, doing small things, sorry, makes a big impact actually to, to climate change. Quite often people think it's such a big problem, they can't have any impact themselves, but they can. Also, obviously there's the extra revenue. We, um, on the app, everything is, th is sold at a third of the full retail value of a product. So there is um, some significant cost recovery there. Uh, and it also can be used to then either help the bottom line, obviously, but what a lot of our partners do is then donate that revenue to their chosen charities. 
because this essentially is bonus, bonus revenue that you wouldn't have otherwise received. There is brand benefits to being with Too Good To Go as well, because we um, shows you basically our business that cares. Um, we are shouting about our impact all the time and obviously shouting about the businesses that are working with us. And then finally, um, because we work on um, our app works on a geolocation, we, it means you're actually helping the local community um, get more food um, at a cheaper price as well. So it's becoming more accessible to more people. And that's everything from me. Um, so please do get in touch if we could be of use and I'll pass back over to Paul. Great, thanks very much, Caroline. And uh, just to back at what you said, I was surprised to see at Flourish, we were actually using it on about day three or four in the middle of complete carnage when we have people queuing to get in every day, they still managed to have time to, to do too good to go, so that must be easy to use. So we lost Patrick due to a, an internet problem. Uh, he's back with us now, I won't introduce him again, but Patrick, over to you now to talk about Winnow. Thanks, Paul, and sorry about the internet um, issue. Definitely need to upgrade. Um, <laughs> okay, perfect. I'm really happy to go after to, uh, um, to present after Too Good To Go because we actually do partner um, with you guys, we do have some uh, some clients. So I think both we know and Too Good To Go complement each other very well. Um, so let me take you take you through about Wino and uh, our collaboration with Cotswold Fair and how we're helping them to measure and to reduce food waste. So Wino develops technology to help commercial kitchens to reduce food waste. The company was built on the vision that food waste was too valuable to waste. Our mission is to connect the commercial kitchen, create a movement of chef, and inspire others to see that food is too valuable to waste. Food waste is hard to measure and, by definition, hard to manage. Our digital tools provide data to drive improvement in kitchen production processes and also help to cut food waste in half. We help our clients to save money and also reduce their environmental footprint at the same time. So far, and you can see some stats on the screen, we've helped our clients to save over 36 million meals in over 40 countries. We're based and headquartered here in London, but we have offices all around the world and recently opened our new office in, um, in Chicago. So food waste is a global problem. Um, I can see that we've already, we're really good at defining all of us, the, the problem. We have very similar, um, similar stats, uh, but every time I'm looking at it, I find it even, uh, you know, even more shocking that a third of all of the food uh, that we produce um, is never eaten. Why is that? It's because there is a lack of tools to understand how much we're producing. And the cost of food waste is 3 billion just for the UK hospitality and food service sector. The data from our 1,500 clients worldwide shows an increase actually of food waste due to post-COVID reopening. Uh, forecasting demand is becoming very difficult. So having a, an accurate system to measure your food waste and to track it uh, is becoming uh, very important for commercial kitchens. Typically, we see that between five to 15% of the food that we purchase uh, will just go straight to the bin. So where does the food waste occur? And we know we have the technology and the tools to help you uh, understand that. And the statistics, uh, the data that you can see on that screen comes from our 1,500 uh, clients globally. So we really see that this is where it happens the most and where um, food waste occurs the most is at overproduction stage, uh, you can see. And our data shows that typically food waste costs kitchens between 4% to 12% of the total food purchasing costs. So it's a very significant amount. As you can imagine, uh, we work with global uh, and, and large volume sites like uh, large caterers here in the UK, like Compass Group. So if you suddenly multiply that by the number of their sites, this is uh, absolutely significant. So how will we now help um, Coats Welfare to reduce their food waste? Well, first, uh, we're implementing one of our solutions. So we have um, different solution. I only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to focus on our cutting edge technology, uh, Winnow Vision with uh, AI in, uh, uh, included. So first, we're going to help them to record it because most of the commercial kitchens um, have having difficulties to measure um, food waste. Uh, let's face it, it's, not, um, it's, it's really hard to actually uh, uh, engage chef to, to measure food waste because if you don't have the right tool, this is very much time consuming. And we know is tackling that by providing a, a system and a solution that I'm going to show you straight after 
of how to measure and record food waste uh, without efforts. Based on those data, they'll be able to track it. They will work with them to establish a baseline to understand what is the food waste level in their operation. And we will forward them a daily and a weekly report to really identify the top areas of waste. Uh, what are the low hanging fruits? Where can they actually straight away reduce the food waste? Uh, and all of those reports, we also them uh, giving them evidence uh, when they talk back to uh, purchasing or when they actually look at portion control suddenly they have access to a data and access to a world of data that they didn't have access to before because they didn't have the right tool to measure it accurately. Those reports will help them to drive change and to discuss within the kitchen with the chef, the kitchen staff of how they could um, uh, improve it or how they could reuse uh, what is basically um, uh, what has a destination, which is the bin. So we're really empowering them. Um, we know is not um, a spying tool in the kitchen. Some chefs sometimes see it as this at the beginning. It's actually quite the opposite. We're here to help them and to give them the, the best performing tool in the, in the market to measure and to reduce food waste. So what ways do we record using the system? I want to say basically every reason why you should be, you should be, you should be putting food waste in the, uh, in the bin. From an inventory perspective, so ingredients that are um, uh, gone bad or expired, trainings, um, cooking error, unserved food, overproduction, and also plate waste. So all of these um, reasons of why you were putting the food in the bin needs to be selected when you're facing a window screen. It is really important because that defines at which moment the food is being placed in the bin. And then based on that, and based on those reports, you will be really able, uh, really quickly able to identify where those food waste occur in your operation. You should be able to see the video now of how the window vision AI system works. So there's a connected scale, you place the food in the bin and it automatically recognizes uh, what has been placed in the bin. It usually takes two to three seconds. Uh, we usually ask um, our clients to put the same tray of ingredients. And after that, they will always see on the screen uh, what you're seeing right now. What would happen if I was gonna see this every day? What will be the cost per week? What would be the cost per year, the environmental cost in CO2 emissions, portions, and obviously the exact amount of what you've just placed in the bin. So this is really powerful. When we talk to chef, they say, well, since we've implemented Widow, the, the team, uh, and even myself, suddenly we're putting a, a financial figure uh, linked to food waste. So you're probably wondering, where do you get the costing? Well, we got it from our clients. So Cotswold Fair, for example, has communicated to us uh, the ingredients costing and their menus, so we can really build a bespoke solution for their site. That means that when Cotswold Fair will place um, chicken in the bin, it will be based on how much they've been paid that chicken from. So it's really precise. And we, the idea with the winner reporting is also to make our reporting talk to their uh, uh, PNL uh, reporting as well. So it's it's really precise. The idea again is to drive reduction and and demonstrate that reduction. This is how the technology works. So um, it takes a, the system has a camera underneath and takes a picture of every single operation that is being placed in the bin. And then it overlays the difference with the previous operation. You have a connected scale linked via Bluetooth to the main console, which allow to measure and weight every single item that you're placing in the bin. The system is very precise. To give you an example from a bin perspective, the system can tell you dif the difference between uh, salmon and red tuna. Uh, I cannot tell you the difference just by looking at the bin, but the system can do. And, and we're getting it more and more precise, um, obviously, with the increasing number of clients that we have. So where I showed you of like how hardware is helping Cotswold Fair to measure and to uh, identify food waste. But what really makes the uh, really strength of, of Wino is our reporting platform. Because if we're good at capturing it, we need to be really good at it, at demonstrate and at showing to our um, um, to our clients globally what does it mean and where does it occur for them to take the right action and and uh, and and the right action based on those reports. Those reports need to be precise, accurate um, to drive change. They will receive. Um, they have access, sorry, to the Winner Hub, and the Winner Hub gives them access to all of the data that they have that is being recorded by the system. So you can have multiple systems across multiple sites. Uh, we work with large hotel groups or, or catering organizations that have 
over 200 sites. And with one click, they can actually compare and, and, and benchmark the food waste across their different sites. Very precise, but also, as you can see, very high level, very visual um, for the chef to really identify um, food waste. And then to summarize, I know I'm speaking quickly, but kitchen using, we know, um, are saving um, 40 million. Uh, actually, no, now we actually more than that. Um, uh, the goal of the window is really to help those clients to measure, but also to reduce food waste. So if you have a site, a medium, uh, medium site size of around 400k annual food costs, you can expect the system to save you at least um, $20,000 or, uh, or so. So we're trusted by chef in over 40 countries and in over 1500 kitchens, you see um, below across all of the hospi different hospitality sector that we work with. If you do have any questions or if you're uh, running a site uh, um, that you believe will benefit from uh, using Wino, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. And um, just, I haven't actually seen those graphics of how it recognizes the food before, so that was really interesting. Um, brilliant. Great. And uh, next up, we've got Jenny Costa, who's the founder and CEO of Ruby's in the Rubble. This is a Cotswold Fair food supplier. Um, I think about seven or eight years, is it, Jenny? You've, we've been... Uh, like that, yeah. Yeah, sounds, uh, sounds a long time. So, as I mentioned before, they are a B Corps. They make uh, great tasting condiments from fruit and veg that would otherwise go to waste. And I'll let her... Uh, tell you the rest of the story so over to you Jenny. Wonderful thank you very much Paul and such a well selected group of um, businesses and charities today I think it's a real um, showcase of why food waste is needing to be tackled at so many different levels and everyone's got a different solution to it and um, so Ruby's in the rubble. Um, Sorry just before you go we, we can see all your slides here so I don't know it's in the the wrong uh, mode. My concern. Um, I think at the top where it says use slideshow, I think that will switch. Okay. Oh, sorry, when I went uh, presenter mode there and then I go use slideshow. Don't all... worry, if you, if you, we can live with it if you, if you can't find out how to do it. So. Well, I'm going to have to live with no, no notes, but I'll, I'll go for it. Um, so, um, at Ruby's in the Rubble, we make delicious tasting condiments from fruit. We, yeah, we're sorry, we can't see anything at the moment. So. Can't see anything? <laughs> I can see everything, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's us that needs to see it, though. <laughs> right, let me... Um... Sorry, one second, everyone. Okay. I think I'll just have to live with no notes, but we can um, we can do that. Okay, is that better? Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so yes, Ruby's in the rubble. We make um, award-winning condiments from fruit and veg that would otherwise be discarded, often due to size, shape, colour, but sometimes simply just um, supply and demand imbalances. And I started Ruby's in two thousand and twelve. Um, at the time, uh, food waste, well, when I first started looking into food waste in 2010, it was a really hippie notion. We were a pioneer business in this space of creating a, I suppose, a business from what other people were trying to, to get rid of or, or waste. And um, as a sort of bit of background on me, I, I was brought up on a farm, um, very sustainably minded on the west coast of Scotland. And food was always so much a part of our everyday living. Um, my mum was a really keen gardener and she prided herself on the fact that she could feed the whole family from fruit and veg from the, from the, the garden all year round. And so preserving and pickling and making condiments was a really natural way of, um, of reducing waste. Then I went off to university, I did a, um, studied maths and ended up in a hedge fund. And I ended up reading an article on bin diving one day and it made me think about the supermarkets of locking up food at the end of the day. And again, this was back in 2010 where really, I mean, the, things have changed so much since then. Um, but people you know, were trying to get rid of food and other people were trying to, trying to get a hold of it. And it just made me think of the whole food supply 
system and food being perishable and unpredictable and governed by weather and humans being unpredictable as well and how with, with our system that we've currently got supermarkets at the, the middle of it and food being displayed in such ample beautiful um, amounts what happens when food is when, when that supply and demand doesn't balance um, and it got me researching food waste as, as, um, as everyone sort of mentioned starting to read about all these facts that um, again, back in the time, it felt like I was undiscover discovering this sort of secret that no one was really shouting about. And the, the main thing that really sat with me was that we have plans to double our food supply by 2050, yet we're wasting a third of everything we produce. And when agriculture is the single largest contributor to greenhouse gases, we can't afford to be this wasteful with food. It was only a couple of generations ago when we had a different attitude towards food and, and no one would waste in their fridge. Um, so I, I really wanted to create a brand that raised awareness of this need to value food again and see it as a precious resource, but was also a practical solution. So in come the Food Waste Heroes. This is the Rubies and the Rubble range. And um, we started with my mum's recipes from her vegetable garden. Um, it was her, her spicy tomato relish uh, with an onion relish and um, different other fruit flavoured chutneys which again, as well, I was mentioning earlier, it was a really traditional way of preserving when something's in season or you've got an abundance of something and being able to enjoy it for years to come. And then we launched our mayonnaise range and, and our, more recently our ketchup range. But when, when we very first started, I started going along to wholesale fruit and veg markets at sort of three in the morning and it was seeing waste with my own eyes and sort of seeing pallets of fruit and veg coming into the country that hadn't even made a shop shelf. And so I thought, this is just like my mum's garden on giant scale. It's, it's perfectly good now, but it needs a home. Um, and I need to create it a, a solution that can add shelf life to it and add value. And that was why I started in condiments and, um, and where we've taken it sort of, um, as, we, as we go forward. So two of the big things that we're always looking for as a company is that it's got to taste good and it's got to do good. And with, with doing good, I think it's why we as a, as, as a food business or a food um, manufacturer operate very differently because we've, we're not just thinking of what's going to be in demand, what are people going to really want, but we, we start with what have we got supply of and what are we going to have a huge abundance of that we can really create a new home for. Um, and it took us years in, in creating our, our way of processing as well because you'd often, for example, bananas being one of the biggest fruits that are wasted in the UK, um, and no one would process those bananas. Also bananas, they can't go into anaerobic digestion. Um, when they decompose, they have a, a really a methane gas and they're very hard to get rid of. So we knew we wanted to do something with that, um, but then finding someone that was gonna hand peel bananas um, and finding a, creating a recipe that we could utilize. And I started looking into, we had a mango chutney at the time, and it was a play on a mango chutney to create it with bananas that could accompany um, uh, curry or to go alongside something like a Caribbean chicken dish um, and it's got cayenne pepper and ginger it's a fantastic product it's a bit of a marmite people either love or hate it um, but it was just for us a, a real symbol of let's let's make sure that we create solutions to problems within the supply chain as well as just great tasting products um, and that's really at the essence of all of our products and, and the range they're in general made from fruit and veg um, until we created our mayonnaise range. So um, the way that we work or where we tackle food waste in the supply chain is further up the chain. So either at the farm um, where up to 40% of a crop can be wasted often being the wrong size, shape or color. Um, or as I was mentioning earlier, um, it might be that it has a, doesn't have the shelf life to then go to a supermarket. Uh, or go to a warehouse, get sorted, go into supermarket shelves, sit for a long time and then sit in your home. But um, we knew that we could have three, four days shelf life on it to be able to turn it into a product that then has a two year shelf life. Um, and the, the anomaly to, to using fruit and veg is our mayonnaise is, and they're based on aquafaba, um, which is that, that 
for I'm sure most of you will know, but that bean water and um, the weird water that you get in the can of chickpeas, which has a similar property to an egg white. And I remember reading articles around vegans making meringues from it um, about seven, eight years ago. I thought if they can make a meringue, I really want to get into mayonnaises. And so I started making a, a mayonnaise from this aquafaba. And we've teamed up with hummus manufacturers across the country. And when they cook their chickpeas, they normally flood pour that water out the drain, down the drain. And we now collect that water, we create an aquafaba powder from it so that we're not shifting water around and it goes straight into our mayonnaise as, as the base. Um, and I'll, I'll, just to, in case it's useful as well, I'll go through um, one of our products. So I'll, I'll take the ketchup um, just to give you an idea of how we create a product or how, how we look at ingredients. Um, so our ketchup is actually filled with surplus pears when we looked at ketchup, um, tomato in the ketchup is, in a typical ketchup is around 10 to 11% of a ketchup. The two biggest ingredients is water and sugar. Um, so we really knew, we knew when we wanted to create a big impact on this product, we were wanting to tackle the sugar and water as well. Um, and we, we, we created, we worked with a cooperative pear farmers and created a pear puree that we could then substitute the sugar and the water from the ketchup. We played with doing one whole, taking all of the sugar out and it tasted a bit like a tomato puree. So we eventually got to something after a lot of blind taste tests that um, with every 100 kilos of ketchup sold, sold, we can save 40 kilos of pears and have a, um, a, a big carbon footprint impact as well with each product. And this is another thing that we do with all of our customers is we send them um, an impact report mainly as well just to make them aware and to try and get them excited about reducing food waste within their whole business as well um, and to get that real impact which is as i'm sure all of us have struggled with it's very hard to communicate food waste in a quick or why someone should care about food waste in a quick way um, so, so as a as a sort of process we pick all the um, ingredients at harvest time we then can them so that they are preserved and we draw them off into our production whenever we're creating um, ketchup. And it, our ketchup, um, pre-COVID anyway, 80% of um, our business was focused on out of home to so the restaurants and pub market. And we had a refill, we have a refillable solution. So we sell them 10 litre um, bulk ketchup and we have a screen printed glass bottle so they can refill that um, bottle. Um, since uh, COVID, though, it's been an amazing shift that a lot of our retailers have started taking on that refillable option as well. Um, and it's forced us to, to really grow our retail business. Again, so Jenny, we're going to run out of time for the last speaker. And uh, are, yeah. you, are you nearly done? I'm almost done, yes. Uh, this is just a little bit of an understanding as well of, of what our products look like against other, other brands. Um, and again, just, just as companies that are focused on food waste and focused on sustainability at the heart of it. We've, uh, we're very passionate about packaging as well and just making sure that everything that we do is reducing waste, um, which was, this was our stance against you no know, sachets. Instead, just telling people, we'll send you a bottle on us. And most people have ketchup in their fridges. So there's, there's never a need to send out a sachet with a, a delivery to home. But that's, uh, that's Ruby's in a nutshell. And I'm here for any questions afterwards. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And that's something that's come through all the presentations so far is the communication with the customer of the reduced impacts they're making through buying the product or through using the window in the kitchen. I think that is a really important part of this is, is making it more, making people more aware of the damage they normally do to the environment if they're not doing this better behavior. So finally, another Cotswold Fair supply, a more recent one, um, Dashwater only started four years ago, but have made a big impact in the, the world of uh, soft drinks and in the specialty food world. Uh, Alex Wright is the founder of Dashwater and they use wonky sh and crushed and all sorts of weird uh, fruits to make some delicious drinks. So Alex, over to you. I do, yes. Thank you so much, Paul. And just before I start quickly, um, firstly, a big thank you to Dan, Patrick, Caroline and Jenny. Really interesting um, presentation so far and a little bit of a very hard act to follow. Um, I think what you just mentioned there, Paul, with awareness 
and a follow-up with education as well more broadly um, is really what we're trying to do at DASH in order to help raise um, food waste um, and make sure that it's top of mind for people, um, not just upstream, but also downstream as well in the supply chain. Um, and it was interesting, Jenny, what you were saying as well, that back uh, in the early days for Rubies, not that many people were talking about food waste. Um, and it really wasn't um, that high on both the national um, agenda. And now it really is becoming part of that. But it's really due to platforms like today that is making that possible. So thank you. Um, I'm now going to share my presentation. Hopefully it works. Um, so can you give a thumbs up if that looks good? Fantastic. Great. So I've got uh, I've got less than 10 minutes to um, have a whistle stop tour of Dash and what we're trying to do, uh, raising awareness about food waste and um, using surplus along the way. So by way of a short content, I'm going to introduce Dash. I'm going to talk about the issue of food waste in a very concise way because a lot of people have talked about it so far. And then the third point is a little bit about B Corp um, and carbon analysis, which ties into food waste as well. Firstly, on the introduction. So what is Dash? Hopefully you've all seen and tried the product. Dash is a very simple product to make. We use three simple ingredients. That is water, bubbles, and one key fruit and veg that would otherwise go to waste. The mission and our reason for being is uh, very clear. Jack and I, my co-founder, um, we both come from farming backgrounds. So myself from West Sussex and Jack from Shropshire. And we would see firsthand that around a third of fruit and veg doesn't end up on people's plates. And it was crazy seeing the scale growing up. And we wanted to use this fruit and veg in order to upcycle it into a product that would prevent it from going to waste. And at the same time, we partnered with a food waste charity called Feedback that hasn't been mentioned so far today, who are absolutely brilliant at gleaning, which is the process of matching farmers that have surplus to people that want to take it off their hands to buy it in, in our case. And so they were fantastic at being able to us with farmers to save that fruit and veg. And while we were looking at products to upcycle, we saw beverage nationally, which is stuffed full of sugary and artificially filled ingredients. And so with Dash, we use this fruit and veg that we buy from farmers um, that would otherwise go to waste and create it into a what we think a really delicious beverage that doesn't have any sugar or sweetener. We try to use our business as a force for good. And so what does that mean? It, it, it distills down into, into, into three key areas. The first is B Corp. I'm not going to run into this um, too much because everyone knows um, what B Corp is about today. Um, but essentially, by being part of this great community, we're able to have our business really at the forefront of high standards, both for social but also environmental um, performance measures. The second here is saving fruit and veg that would otherwise go to waste. This is uh, us on a team day with uh, feedback down in East Sussex near Hastings, um, where we picked 1.5 tonnes of fruit and veg that day and recirculated it to charities in and around Brighton. Um, but overall, each year we try and save a, a, a really, um, what we believe is a considerable amount of, of fruit and veg. Um, but more importantly, we want to try and use Dash as um, a platform to help educate consumers about the issue of food waste um, and what they can do to try and support too. Lastly, on, on the right, you can see that Dash is crafted in the UK. And what is really exciting, and I'll come back onto it in a minute, is that Dash is 
um, after recording our carbon output has the lowest carbon output of any soft drink recorded. And that's because tool crafted in the UK, the spring water that we infuse comes out of the spring, having not seen sunlight for the last 30 years and is in the can within seven minutes. Our raspberries and black currants come from within a 15 mile radius. Um, and so everything that we try and do is as localized as possible. It's worth saying that we're not perfect and we do need to try and make sure that we're able to cut back on any plastic that is used within the supply chain, create efficiencies to make sure that our raw ingredients are as close as possible. Um, but all the good stuff that we're working on at the moment. The issue of food waste. So I was going to go on to this uh, in a little bit more detail, but seeing as we've gone through it quite considerably now already, the three key stats for me that really jump out that I think we should all be um, aware of is that a third of food produced globally goes to waste each year that translates into about 1.3 billion tonnes. That kind of tonnage is, is relatively incomprehensible, well it certainly is for me anyway. And so just slicing it down into 30% of fruit and veg goes to waste. I think it is a, is a more um, bite-sized stat, excuse the pun, that I think is um, a little easier for everyone to uh, work off at home. Um, the second is that if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases after China and the US. And lastly, for me, I think this is really comes back to the awareness and the education piece that I think we all need to um, work harder on is that in most developed countries, half of all food waste takes place at home. It's that bit of salad at the back of the fridge um, that you don't necessarily think that you're going to use and you think you can use tomorrow and then suddenly it goes off. Um, or it's the ingredients that are in your fruit bowl the very bottom and um, we think we can use it for a cake that we're going to be able to create next week but then suddenly it goes off and we we didn't use it it's all those little bits that i think really add up and that we should try and make sure that we can reduce last bit on b corp and carbon analysis so why i thought this was interesting is that um we used um, Carbon Cloud, um, specific, specifically Liv, who um, is on this call today, who introduced herself earlier at Dash, did a fantastic job at um, really looking at all of the components that create our Dash products. Um, and what you can see here on the left is that for every can that we make, 0 0.11 parts of CO2 per kilogram goes into making a can of dash, which although that's we're in a good place at the moment, what is interesting looking at these stats here is that 80% of our total CO2 emissions come from the fact that consumers only recycle 50% of the aluminium can. And so what we need to do at dash is we need to make sure that we are really driving awareness to encourage more recycling. So it's not just food waste, but it's also making sure that wider recycling um, is, um, is done as well. We've also seen that through direct to consumer with COVID and now a very considerable proportion of our business goes through direct to consumer. We need to make sure that the white vans that are driving around, especially in city centers that can be diesel guzzlers, those Band or the delivery process is as um, sustainable as possible. So how we offset all of our um, the, the carbon that is uh, emitted through our total web shop supply chain. Um, and it's something that we're looking at further for the rest of the business as well. And the last thing is just to be really careful at Dash to make sure that throughout our supply chain, yes, we're using surplus ingredients um, at, at the beginning of the process, but throughout the supply chain, um, making sure that there is very little waste that goes on. 
And this is this comes back to the common sense part, um, which is making sure that the transportation of the product, we're using full pallets rather than part pallets. And we are produce, we're making sure that the distance between journeys is as short as possible. So those are three interesting, well, hopefully interesting insights of the carbon analysis that um, just shows that we're trying to go a little bit deeper um, into um, the analysis of how we can better ourselves as a business. So that is me. <laughs> Great, thanks. Thanks very much. <laughs> Sounded like a, a, a sub man there. I think that Ben's been nudging you. So perfect, actually. It's uh, exactly 1300 hours. So um, we, we there are a few questions in, in the chat, but obviously appreciate some of you may need to, to disappear at one. Um, but feel free to, to hang around to, to listen to the, the Q&A. Obviously, you can always eat your lunch at the same time. Um, ben, do you want to read out a couple of the questions that were higher up the, the message board? And Seriously. thanks, Alex. And uh, obviously, just in case people go, thanks for coming, first of all. And also thanks to all our speakers. Some excellent content there. And I think um, there's things that we can all do to be... Uh, to be better in this area. So, yeah, over to you. So the first question comes from Sophie Gaston of this, and it says, question for Caroline, love the app, especially when a vegan cafe pops up on there. It's great that you flag vegetarian ma magic bags. In the future, will you look to highlight vegan magic bags, or is this an option that I've missed? I'm afraid it's the latter, an option that you've missed. We already do. Um, so we've got the option on the app to say whether a bag is either vegan or vegetarian. Um, obviously, if it is a store that is vegetarian but does also vegan food, we will only say vegetarian because um, we're not obviously nature food waste. We don't know necessarily what will be in the bag, so we will only highlight it as vegetarian. But if there is a store on there which is purely vegan, we do highlight that as vegan as well. Thanks, Caroline. And one more for you. Um, Kelly from Becco Pet says, uh, hi to Caroline from Two Good To Go, very illuminating stats. Is this 10% from food waste that goes to landfill and not properly combusted on a household level? Would installing an incinerator at home help? Um, no. <laughs> uh, so basically, I mean, the best the best thing is to is prevention, really. Um, the 10% is, if you think about, let's say, I don't know, a banana, um, it it takes a lot of it as people have said on this call already it takes a lot of resources into producing that that food so if you think about the the land the water the feed the then the the transportation um you know if if we're talking about processed food then there's all the manufacturing and processes as well that go into that each stage along that way you're, they're producing co2 emissions um and then if that food is then obviously ended up in landfill that again produces co2 emissions but it's also all of that um you know, resources that have gone into making that product that are then ending up um, just wasted as well. And, and they're still being emitted uh, despite this product ending up in landfill. So the best thing that we can do at home is um, prevention um, and also to um, an education really. So using products, you know, what do we do before the days of packaging? Uh, use your senses, use your common sense, use, use your look, smell, taste, don't waste kind of attitude um, and really try and use everything as much as possible. And then compost if you can. Thanks, Caroline. Um, so we've got one other comment here just about the importance of supply chains, um, but I think it was more of a more of a comment than a question. But maybe at this point we can open up if anyone has any kind of final questions that they wanted to ask to our speakers today. Now's your opportunity. Okay. Uh, well, in that case, uh, unless anyone has any, I think there's one, maybe one final question in the chat. Um, does something like Olio help? Great, all speakers focus on prevention, but given half of food waste opportunity exists within homes, yeah, I guess kind of focusing more on kind of home uh, home solutions. Barnes, did you want to elaborate on that at all? Uh, yeah, I don't know what the overlap is with... Um too good to go, but Olio seems a good system for the, for the end of cycle where prevention can't fix something. You've got this sort of community of food sharing on a, on a domestic level. We started to use it just as people rather than a business and it seems to work. So 
don't know if there are other things like that. There's, yeah, there's an app called Kitch as well, which is um, quite about, again, it's kind of about prevention as well, but it monitors um, all of your your shopping essentially at home and will give you recipe ideas for, for products that are going out of date, basically. Um, but yeah, anything anything that helps redistribute food um, is and it doesn't end up wasted is, yeah, it's the way we want to be going. We need to band together to, to solve this problem. It's not an easy fix. Um, so the many as many solutions as you can have as a person, as a business, um, the better, really. OK, good. Well, thanks again to Alex, Jenny, Caroline, Patrick and Dan. Much appreciated contributions. Um, Alex I did mention during his uh, introduction that everyone knows about B Corp, which a lot more do now than they did when we first certified. But if anyone wants to know more, more about B Corp, which has been mentioned a few times, and um, all the companies on the call today were actually B Corps as well, and obviously City Harvest is a charity. But anyone wants to know more about that, then feel free to contact us. But Thanks again for coming. Keep your eyes peeled for the next Cotswold Fair sustainability webinar and look forward to seeing you again. Enjoy your lunch. Bye-bye.